So when I got cut, in that moment, I just thought I was a complete failure. Let down my parents, my siblings, everyone who made sacrifices to help me to get to that level. Uh, and because it was the off season, you know, I was able to hide it really well. Welcome to this episode of REC Arena's Roundtable Discussion. The topic is mental health in sport. My name is Robbie Fig, and uh, I work with an organisation that works in mental health, but I'm here to talk to some incredible athletes uh, in their chosen field. Uh, we'll start down with you, Damien. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, and why you might be here today? Yeah, uh, Damien Martin, former basketball player in the NBL. I was lucky enough to be in the National Basketball League for 13 seasons, two over in Sydney and the 11 here in Perth with the Wildcats. Uh, and highlight of my career was heading over to the Rio Olympics in 2016. Love it. And Robin? Yeah, so uh, Tokyo 2021 Paralympian in wheelchair sprinting, 100 metres, um, and now playing wheelchair rugby. So, um, yeah. Cool transition. I want to yeah. hear about that. Sunday. Yeah, so I'm Sunday Ariang. I play for the West Coast Fever currently. I've been there since 2019 and I was originally born in Ethiopia and moved here when I was one. Wonderful. Heath. Uh, yeah, and Heath Tessman, uh, professional rugby player for just over a decade, playing for teams on the East Coast, but then eight years here in Perth, playing with Western Force and uh, yeah, loving it here in Perth and just loving being part of the community here at home. Well, it's a bit too late to say welcome to Perth, but welcome to Perth. Yeah, no. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. And you too, Damien. Um, we might start back with you, Damo. Just uh, uh, want to start on a high note before we get into the sort of trickier topics. Uh, what is it that sport brings to people's lives that is, is just such a positive um, element of, of life? And, and obviously a lot of people attach to sport from outside, but inside, how does it feel? Uh, well, there's so much of it is just the unknown. So you're driven by success, getting the utmost out of your ability, short-term goals, long-term goals. But the reality is you're learning life lessons along the way, the setbacks, the failures, but also the highs that sport can bring that I don't think anything else can replicate that raw emotion after a win or a team selection or seeing your teammate do well, whatever it might be. So as you get older, you probably just take it for granted and then eventually you retire, you reflect and you go, that was incredible. I wish I'd been more present in that moment or appreciated what I had. Yeah, whilst you're in the moment, you kind of live day by day and you live by those cliche one percentage here athletes talk about, but then you become an adult and you realise you are the person or the product because of the sport and the lessons along the way. Love that. Uh, the lessons and, and I guess the uh, community and the connection that, that something like the Paralympics would bring. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think uh, especially for the disability community, the Paralympic movement is a, is a huge driver just to sort of help us take control of that narrative a little bit and rewrite some of those negative stereotypes I think people have about life with a disability. You know, my, my disability has allowed me to play para sport, which in turn has, you know, taken me around the world, introduced me to some incredible people and just given me a whole lot of opportunities that I otherwise wouldn't have had. So, yeah, I think it just helps to sort of normalise disability in a way because, you know, sport is something that brings everyone together and something that everyone can relate to. So mm, It absolutely is. I love that, that point around people being able to relate to the similar uh, space and, and use that for the good. So you came over from Ethiopia. When was that and, and what brought you here? Yeah, so I came over from Ethiopia in 2002. I was one about to turn two and I came over with my mum, my dad and my older sister and my parents pretty much just wanted us to have the best life possible and I think for them growing up in a country where it was conflicted with um, issues that, you know, affected them, even to this day I think it still kind of affects them, but they just didn't want us to go through the same thing and my dad said he really wanted us to get education. Now to think that we are growing up such happy kids like I'm playing professional sports something that I never thought I'd be able to do and I love the sport so much and even seeing my younger siblings that were not born in Ethiopia but born in Australia just seeing them go into the kids they are today is just amazing so yeah it's an incredible we live in a pretty incredible country don't we, we do. you guys get to represent it which we'll touch on as well um hey tell us a bit about your journey to to Perth what brought you here uh it was just opportunity really like I'm someone I guess similar to Damien where I've always play sport from such a young age, uh, been involved in it, whatever, no matter what kind of sport it was, whether it was in the water, on the land, I was always doing it. Um, what I discovered though, 
not that I was actually good at it, but I love being part of a team. So being part of a bigger group, trying to achieve something kind of bigger than yourself as well was always really important to me and trying to help get, I guess, excellence out of those around me as well. And that was where I always found my spot in any team. I was definitely never the fastest, the, the strongest, anything like that. But like my strength was being able to, to try and bring the, the best out of those around me. And uh, that was one of the reasons that I always chose rugby. Rugby was for all shapes and sizes. But yeah, and I was fortunate enough to be given an opportunity over here after spending a few years on the East Coast. And yeah, the group that we always had here, uh, it was just, it wasn't the most successful group, but it was a team that was always striving and that I love being a part of. Obviously the topic is mental health in sports. So I'll start uh, with a question I think that most of you be able to answer pretty quickly, hopefully, but what does mental health mean to you? To me personally, mental health was something that it was early on in my career, it was something that maybe wasn't prioritized as it should. It was something that I took for granted, I think more than anything else. Uh, it was more as I went on, I realized that like kind of as, as athletes, we love measuring things being able to say, okay, I'm getting stronger, I'm getting fitter. Um, you know, we've got the score, KPIs, yeah, we've got the score at the end of the game, I've got a time for my sprint. But mental health was always something that is a lot less measurable. And so it was something that you probably would only become aware of a little bit more early on in my career when you were, I guess, falling behind on the scoreboard. Um, so I was fortunate enough to, early on in my career, be able to learn to prioritize it, give myself time, like I would block out times in my calendar and it would help me during the week if I had a big tough session Tuesday knowing that Wednesday morning you know I've got a little bit of time for myself away from sport away from everything else and it would give me that opportunity to refresh and reflect I guess as well. Same question to you Robin. Yeah I definitely didn't prioritize mental health for a long time um, in my career I sort of just like loved the grind I love training hard so as long as I was you know getting stronger and pushing hard I was sort of you know like wow why does that sort of th side of things really matter um, but then yeah leading into the game sort of really had to reflect on that because it can make a, such a huge difference in a in a performance way um, in competition and I think you know I'd gotten to a point in my training where everything was going really well but sometimes just not being able to put it together in competition and that was sort of like the missing link so um, yeah definitely started to prioritize that later on. I, I feel like there's there's so much to dig into later on there as well, how, how it relates to that connection and, and community as well um, that you mentioned before and, and representing uh, a, a sector of the, the, the population. Uh, Damo, uh, I think you've spoken pretty publicly about the highs, the lows and all the in-betweens and, and grief and loss and different things that come with it. But sport um, must have played a, a massive role in how your mental health was. How do you look back and, and view it now? Uh, the, I've been very fortunate that the only time I've really kind of gone into a dark place and I wasn't aware of it at the time and I had no education around it or how to deal with it uh, was when I got cut from the 2012 London Olympic team. So I was a part of the Australian squad in 2010 for the World Cup, 2011, and then 2012 they had to cut four of us. So it was a squad of 16, they were only going to take 12 over to London. And we got a message our last night in camp in Melbourne saying tomorrow when you fly back to your capital cities, you'll get a phone call at this allocated time and you'll be made aware where you're, whether you're going to be an Olympian or not. And this was a lifelong dream. You know, all the sacrifices my parents had made to get me to and from trainings and games, all the commitments, it was just something I was obsessed with, to be honest. And then I got the phone call and I'd been told I'd been cut from the team. And it was the off season for the Perth Wildcats, so I didn't have that day-to-day -day routine where I'd wake up, have a purpose, go and see not just my teammates, but my best friends. And so when I got cut, in that moment, I just thought I was a complete failure and a loser, disappointment, no good at the game, let down my parents, my siblings, everyone who'd made sacrifices to help me to get to that level. Uh, and because it was the off season, you know, I was able to hide it really well, uh, act like I was okay and had moved on when in reality, it's like I was living with a hand directly in front of my face where it said all those negative words. And because that's all I could see, that's how I lived. So I simplified all my goals in that moment to trying to win as many championships as possible in whatever time I've got left in the game. But more importantly, be a better person and be a better son. So jumped on a plane, headed home the next day and, and just simplified everything and started to appreciate all those things I'd taken for granted. So yeah, I, I always have lived by now that nothing is worth living like that. Keep it in arm's reach, you know, be realistic about it and work backwards from how you can improve yourself and those around you. It's a pretty awesome perspective that you get when, when things like that happen. Um, coming here to a, to a different country, obviously you might not remember 
yeah. uh, the actual <laughs> adventure over. But in those sort of formative years, the, the first few years, do you remember uh, ever talking about mental health as, as you were growing up? Yeah, so um, I think within our family growing up, mental health wasn't something that was spoken much about in um, our family. I think that kind of came from the fact that my parents didn't grow up with mental health spoken with them. And I think a lot of the times in these multicultural families, like if, you, if you're born, like being born back in like wherever you've come from, um, mental health is something that is not spoken about at all. And I think for them, they think that mental health is like, for them it's like non-existent. Like you're not mentally ill, it's something completely different. So my parents never um, knew anything about mental health and they never had that opportunity to talk to us about it. We kind of started to learn a bit more about mental health through like sports, um, through TV, like watching stuff. And I think um, that's what brought that awareness towards us as kids. And I think growing up as well, we kind of had to take that role on at telling our parents what mental health was. Anyone echo those kind of views? It, does anyone remember when it first came to their their sort of mind and, and it was front and centre? Is there, is there a moment or a, a, a part from... Not to the Wildcats where they'd start to address it because they brought in a sports psychologist. Uh, but before then, and not everyone related to it or bought into it, but before then it was not even a part of the professional sporting realm, but in the back end of my career when social media started to play a big part. I literally remember being 36, sitting at one end of the table, players only meeting, and at the other end of the table, there was an 18 year old teammate. And I'm like, oh my, I'm double the age of my teammate. Like, But he'd grown up with social media and so fell into the patterned behaviors of win games, play well, he was reading about himself, lose games, still reading about himself, and it was just completely different. But he started to let, let, let people who didn't even know affect him. And there's a saying that I once got told back then after getting to the bottom of why he was going through uh, a bit of mental health issue was, you know, never accept criticism from someone he wouldn't go to for advice. And so that's when it started to really ramp up, at least from my side of things, was the setback I went through, but then seeing how it was affecting my teammates. Yeah. I in that, uh, the, the world of Paralympics, that sort of representing a segment of society, that it, it's just amazing to see the empowerment that someone like yourself can give other people through that. Uh, it, is it, quote unquote, easier to talk about those types of things in that space? Because there are so many people going through so many things. Yeah, I think because we all have a bit of a backstory. You know, everyone's sort of been through something. I think everyone is quite open. And I found, like, even for me, accepting my own disability, it was so much easier when I got into parasports because all of a sudden, oh, wow, there's so many other people who are like me, who have similar stories, who are strong, who are competitive, you know. Um, but then I guess on the other hand, you sort of sometimes can feel that little bit of pressure to make things seem positive all of the time yep. because you are trying to combat some of those um, negative stereotypes. Yep. So, yeah. You're always on the yeah. advocacy route. Yeah. Right? yeah. Whereas, you know, sometimes you just want to be the athlete and you just want to focus on, on the thing. So Fair yeah. enough. And I guess to pivot a little bit, but to, to go to that Paralympic experience, can you tell us what it's like to represent your country at a, a Paralympics? Yeah, obviously it's, it's huge. It's such an honour and, you know, um, yeah, it's like a dream come true. It was a bit weird for me because it was the, the 21 games, so the COVID games. Um, so, you know, we were competing in stadiums, 90,000 seater stadiums, and there's like 20 people in the crowd, like our coaches and stuff. So that was that was very, yeah, different. I mean, yeah, I won my medal, literally came back to the village. They gave me two beers and said, go back to your room. <laughs> so I was like, and then I came home to hotel isolation. So that was like a very wild contrast. Um, but yeah, like obviously just having that opportunity and being able to, you know, achieve that pinnacle is, yeah, it's huge. It, it must have been difficult to adjust to the fact that, that there wasn't people there. Yeah. The adulation and the validation, was that something that you kind of... Yeah, I think so. Just so, you know, ha that relief of, oh, wow, you've, you've accomplished this thing that you've trained so hard for and you sort of, you know, you're on that high. And then, yeah, like I said, to be sent back to a hotel by myself for two weeks to sit with my thoughts was, yeah, definitely interesting. Yeah. But, yeah. Did anyone else have a sort of, I, I don't like the C word, COVID, but is, is there any sort of experiences through that time that taught you anything about who you were as a person? It was for me, like my, my career um, came to an end during COVID as well. So that was, um, it was a difficult time transitioning for me uh, from that point of view. And that I, I suffered a little bit during that process too. And a very similar thing, like being away, we we're off in a hub on the East Coast, you know, in the bubble, which you know, you're playing and you're just, you're in this little Petri dish 
probably not the right terminology. When no, we're yeah. About, but, you know, you're in it where you just, you're forced in with all your friends, families and everything like that. And it's brilliant. And then to come out of it and just kind of be stuck by yourself, isolated for a period while you're, you're starting to transition with the next portion of your life as well. Um, yeah, it, it was, it was definitely, it was difficult. Is there some experiences that you can lean on now that you learnt in that time as a leader of young men? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. There are like, like, like it's, it's difficult, like taking on that little bit of extra leadership when you are within a team, like it makes it a little bit harder, but it, it changes from individual to individual. Like obviously, uh, lots of people, when they come into that leadership role, they feel like they bear the burden for every individual that's in their, in their squad. Um, I was lucky enough when I was captaining the team that I was doing it with someone else, another member of the team. So we had co-captains and that's what I find like that from that period of time to now being able to share that load, being able to have someone that you can completely, you know, have some confidence in discuss where you're having problems or where you can look to improve, I think is, is absolutely critical. And that was something that I was very fortunate enough to be able to manage when I was in that leadership role. Sunday, is anyone that you sort of looked up to because, you know, at the higher end of the scale, no, no offence to the 36-18 perspective that we got before, but was there someone that sort of took you under their wing to, to help you with that well-being and, and mental health side of it? Or was it more on the sports side and it just came as a, a byproduct? Um, yeah, I think it was more on the sports side. And as I kind of made my way through um, the team and the years, um, started seeing the psych and that's when that mental health side of it started to come but I think someone who I really did look up to when I was um, um, in the West Coast Fever and when she was there was probably Courtney Bruce and Stacey Francis. Um, they did such a great job at just welcoming me, welcoming me into the environment and also the time that I did kind of join the team was during COVID. Like COVID hit, we went into a hub and they took some extra players and that's when I first experienced what professional um, being a professional athlete was in such a crazy um, period where there was no fans, it was an empty stadium, like it was just intense and insane and it was like my first time being away from family, like I had never left pretty much my mum's side since coming to um, Australia. So it was definitely a very like hard period and I think a lot of the girls did such a great job at just um, you know, like just make me feel comfortable and letting me know that they're there if I need anything. And they taught me how to cook because I didn't know how to cook at that time. So <laughs> learned how to cook yeah, for the first time. Um, just showed me so many new things that I learned. And yeah, I think if it wasn't for them, I probably would have not made it. I don't even think I would have made it through it. So yeah, super, super happy that I was able to experience it with them. What is it about uh, connection and being able to sort of uh, meet like-minded people and go through those similar challenges? How, how positive is that for your mental well-being? Yeah, it's hugely positive. I mean, you know, growing up as the only disabled kid in my school and the only time I saw other disabled people was in hospital, so not exactly like the most positive environment to be interacting with your peers. And then also, you know, just everyone sort of having these ideas on what your life with a disability is going to be like, what you're going to be able to achieve. And then all of a sudden I get thrown into this sport. Everyone has a story. Everyone's just like me. Um, and everyone's achieving, you know, incredible things. Even just as simple as saying, oh, well, so-and-so drives a car. Like, you know, you didn't even think that was going to be possible. Sure. Or, um, you know, they've got a wife and a kid and like a degree, all of these things that, you know, necessarily wouldn't come to mind sometimes when you have a disability. Um, not, you know, I was incredibly lucky that my family has always been super supportive, but just to be able to see someone else that's gone through that. Uh, I actually got into sport because I had a huge operation when I was 12 and was in like full leg casts for like months and months. And my dad just so happened to work with um, Amber Merritt's mum. And Amber Merritt is, uh, you know, gold medal winning Paralympian wheelchair basketballer. And yeah, she just dragged me down and just, yeah, sort of showed me what was possible. It's incredible. They, they talk a lot about lived experience within mental health and how powerful it is to listen to people with lived experiences. It sounds like that kind of uh, parallels with, with what you're talking about there. Um, have, have you guys come across anyone that inspired you in that space of, of uh, positive mental health, positive well-being, and, and sharing their story for, for the better? Have you come across anyone that you can recommend people check out? Uh, yeah, I've, I've got two, so, and both were teammates. And one, I was living with Brad Robbins, 
when he was going through some tough times. He was the current captain of the Wildcats. We'd been mates since our teenage years. So when I was living with him, I was oblivious to what impact was really playing a part of his life uh, because I hadn't seen it before. Fast forward a few years and then Greg Heyer, uh, who was also in the leadership group, you know, he had an injury and he thought, okay, if I'm going to be away from the game for a while, I want to get involved in something uh, other than the Wildcats. And so he got involved in a mental health organization, learned a lot there and has gone on to be a founder of his own one. But hearing two guys I called teammates, tough as nails, I'd run through a brick wall to win a, a basketball possession. But then the vulnerability they showed when they opened up about how they truly were feeling at different times or their lived experience, and just asking the simplest of questions, you know, these days we have, are you okay day? But back then, especially in that environment where there's a lot of, you know, you're trying to be macho, tough, bravado, all that stuff. A lot of it is fake because you dive into below the surface and everyone was going through something at some stage. And uh, Greg in particular would be that one where I'm forever jealous of his leadership ability to notice someone was not themselves at training. Uh, and then he'd be the one that would reach out. Uh, Heath, did you have any sort of... Uh... I guess someone that you looked up to in that space at all, or is it something that you were called upon as, as a leader? It wasn't really, it wasn't really an individual per se. It was like, well, obviously we worked with our PD and our, our sports psychs and everything with the team, but it was the understanding that came from that was that everyone's running their own race. Like everyone there wants to be great. Everyone wants to excel at what they're doing. But like we were touching on before, like everyone goes home to different things. Once you leave the building, you're not a rugby, just a rugby player still. You're not just, a netball play, like you're you're a person with fears, with concerns, with everything else, and being able to encompany all of that in together and understand the individual, not just as the athlete that they are, I think helped what we were trying to achieve in with the Western Force as well. And not only that, bringing in that type of person too. So bringing in not just the most, you know, the fastest winger, the the, the strongest front rower, bringing in the whole individual as well so when they would recruit and it helped that whole the whole team dynamic because you've got people that understand each other not only on the field but then away from the field as well and and look to take the time to understand each other on and off the field it, it seems like that's the way forward in in modern sport would, would you agree with that, that that we've got to look at the the personality the persona their own perceptions and, and obviously yeah, absolutely. Ability. Would we agree with that? Yeah, I think athletes are at their best when they're mentally switched on, they're physically fit and they're playing with confidence. And two of those three things are above your shoulders. They're the intangibles that can be controlled by yourself or a coach or whoever has, you know, some influence over you. So physical fitness, you know, that's something that get in the weight room, out on court, whatever it might be. But if you're playing with confidence and you're present in the moment, I think that's when you're at your best. And the two of those three things, in my opinion, are mental health. Uh, Robin, is there someone that you sort of, uh, you mentioned that you had some mentors within the sport, but is there anyone that you sort of came across in your travels and in your research and, and obviously doing incredible work now after um, your career in, in, in this kind of space that really drove you to think about well-being in a different way? I think to be honest, it was probably my parents um, because similarly to Sunday sort of, for the early part of my career, just rejected all of the, yeah, like the psychology side of things and just, you know, thought I just need to train hard. I just need to get the, get the work done. Um, but you know, the reality was I spent a majority of my season training completely alone. I was the only wheelchair racer in WA yeah. and racing against myself. So often when I went away to competitions, was just completely overwhelmed and, and could not really put it together because I just had no marker. As to you wanted it, comparison. Yeah, <laughs> as to where I was, I wanted a little bit of comparison. And I thought, you know, oh, I'm obviously just not training hard enough or, or something. And, you know, my dad coming from a, a professional athlete background himself was like, mm, I think there might be a mental component to this, you know, um, and then sort of, yeah, hooked up with um, the sports psychologist and stuff like that and did a lot of work and got to a place where I was just confident enough in my abilities when I went to those races, it wasn't so overwhelming. Yeah. We, we've, we've heard about the sports psychologist being implemented at, at every um, juncture here. Is it something that you feel has gone from them talking to the individuals about their performance on the field and just the mindset while you're on the field and it's sort of navigated its way, uh, you know, we don't leave our problems at the door kind of thing? Uh, anymore? Is it something that's evolved over the last few years in, in the space that you're in to, to be more encompassing of everything? Yeah, my early days as a sports psychologist, 
maybe got brought in for one presentation. It was almost like just tick this box and move on. And these days they're pretty much full time or they're there several days of the week and open to anyone and everyone. And you know, some players would utilize them, some wouldn't, some coaches bought into it, some didn't, but I do think it goes hand in hand is dealing with the life off the court or off the field does impact your performances on it. Uh, and you know, some guys would get a reputation of being the angriest player on the field or in their sport. And usually as a sports psych, they would try to tear back the layers and say, why are you who you are? And rarely did it have to do with anything to do with the sport. It was things that, you know, their upbringing, who they were, what they were going through. Uh, and so they would address those issues, never the skill set itself. Is there anything, and this might be a real deep question for those that are still involved, but for those that are out of the game, maybe you get a better perspective. Is there anything that you would love to see happening in sporting clubs that isn't in the mental health space? Is there a focus or a, a role that you'd love to see more of? Anything that you've seen work really well? I, I don't like that it takes to get into a pro level where then a sports psych is brought in. I'd like to think that when you go and attend under 14 training camps, that you know, instead of just warming up and getting your hamstrings and your quads ready, there's someone there to help you get your brain ready. Uh, so that those setbacks don't get to a level where you've got no training whatsoever, be doing at the highest level. So the effect is probably more severe than if it was just the norm growing up through those early days. Absolutely. Probably getting the sports psych in there when you're in your 12s and 13s and 14s programs, because you do get to a professional level and then you're kind of overwhelmed with how much you need to like, how much more learnings you need to get in that environment and how much better you need to get at being able to handle the um, mental side of it. Especially with social media, you put together these collections of all these juniors and I go on, I'm like, man, I found the next Michael Jordan. Yeah. Like every day there's these highlight reels of 12, 13, 14 year olds. The reality is that is so fake. That is not who you're gonna be. It comes down to hard work, yeah. not taking shortcuts, et cetera, et cetera. Don't get caught up in how many likes and comments you're getting online. Go out and help your teammates and go to bed that night a better player in person. Fair enough. Is, is there a, a social media, um, is it, is it part of the everyday now? Are we just, in terms of in your uh, chosen vocation, is it something that you check? Is it something that you look at? Is it something that you're worried about? Is it something that you're just super aware of and you kind of want to stay away from? You love current athletes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, for me, I think when I first started, it was something that I was like, okay, with having and seeing and all that. But as I've been in, um, with West Coast Fever for these years now, I've just, once the season starts, like blocking yep. all types of socials that might um, bring up anything to do with netball, because even though I might not be looking, it's still popping up on my feed. And then sometimes you just get curious and you start just looking at comments and all that stuff. So I would prefer to just not see it. So then I don't have any moments of just clicking on it. So you have to, yeah. go you have to Google yourself to get there, right? <laughs> yeah, which I don't do. So. Yeah. Oh, I've never done that either. I wouldn't, no. even, I wouldn't even want to Google myself, so, but yeah. Uh, how about you, Robin? Is, is it something that features in, in your life? Yeah, I think perhaps in a slightly different position um, because we are still building the Paralympic movement. I think it's probably a little bit more positive mm. in that space. People are trying to uplift athletes. It and, can be positive. Yeah, and trying to get to know their story and even, you know, competitors are quite um, positive towards other people online and, and trying to help them sort of, yeah, just really, I guess, raise the Paralympic movement. So we sort of have that common goal um, in mind. And also, you know, a majority of the population isn't too aware of para sports, so they can't really comment. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I think, yeah, slightly different perspective. And you're using it for good podcasting, social media. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Just space. trying to sort of get that word out there. And again, just show young people that there's so many options for them. So. It's funny how a platform can be so many different things to so many different people. Was MySpace a thing when you were? <laughs> <laughs> it all started when you had to rank your friends, I reckon, on MySpace. I, did, I forgot about yeah. the ranking. That yeah. is brutal. All jokes aside. <laughs> uh, was it something that featured in your, in your career as well? Uh, it, it probably started coming back in the tail end of my career. And it, yeah, it was something that you could see the young guys would struggle with a little bit. Um, you know, my rule was always like, if you're going to read some of it, if you're going to read the good stuff, you've got to read the negative stuff as well. But I think, uh, fortunately for myself, I was one of the more mature members of the group. So, like, I was able to read it and discredit whether people were saying I played well or poorly. Like, I could, I could distance myself from those comments, you know, like, essentially the phone was that buffer. Um, whereas some of the guys, younger guys would 
they would struggle slightly. Um, more so like you would see it in the change room. I don't know if you ever noticed in the locker room after the game, like guys going off the field, getting the phone out to then like, and kind of read and almost review. I had, um, I can't remember who said it, but someone was asked a similar question and they basically said, if you want to critique my game or have an opinion on my performance, call me and tell me. Essentially saying, if we're not close enough, we don't have my number, then your opinion doesn't matter whatsoever. And I was older when all the social media stuff was coming through. And I remember coming home one day, I'd had the most random night ever. We we're here at RAC Arena. I was a horrible three-point shooter, but somehow I made a shot against the Sydney Kings. We go to overtime and we win. But then I'm on uh, just texting a mate who does radio. And as I'm texting him, I get a message on Instagram and I open it from someone I didn't know. And they're just abusing me. They're going to do this to my mom, this to my sister, this to me, yada, yada, yada. And I've joked with this guy about it because I didn't care. I took a screenshot, sent it to him. We go on air the next morning to talk about this crazy night. And because I spoke openly about this death threat and all these other things, I then had the federal police call me and I had to make an official statement. And in the end, they believe it was someone in Indonesia gambling on the game. They weren't happy that they lost their bet. And they said this happens all the time. So for me, it, it was water off a duck's back, but you don't know how many people, especially in the higher profile sports, cop it every single game. For me, it was one experience. And like I said, I usually had little impact on the result, but someone who's better at their game or playing the AFL, rugby union, rugby league, I can only imagine how much more they would have experienced similar things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the multi-ruiners they're talking about in AFL at the moment is a big part of- uh, The multi-ruiners, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and in a dead serious way. Uh, Traditional media and, and how it affected your days? I think, oh, for myself nowadays as well, like um, I'm fortunate enough to be doing commentary work with Stan um, where we're calling, you know, rugby games uh, which, which get broadcast. So I feel like myself as well, like there's a responsibility on me to still portray, to give an ac accurate and realistic portrayal of what's happening, but to still keep it optimistic, still try to keep it positive because as someone who had gone through periods where, you know, you're getting torn apart by commentators or journalists, whatever, whoever in the media, uh, I, I knew that it still affected me marginally. So I have a responsibility as well for how I keep these players and, and their headspace then. And, and in your experience, a anything that uh, happened in, in your sort of journey from solo sport to, to team sport as well? That... Yeah, again, I guess it's again, a little bit of a different position. We are very still much fighting for equal broadcasting rights. So if anything, we'd like a little bit more attention, I think, um, just to get people aware of the sport and what we do um, as athletes. But you, I mean, even, you know, with the Paralympics getting way more broadcast and them making a real effort to have people who are involved in the sport commentating uh, makes, a, makes a huge difference. Because I remember even in my Olympic race, the last time the commentary team had seen me race was a, a number of years ago. Um, and they were basically like, oh, she doesn't have a chance at meddling because they hadn't seen me since I was way down the ranking list. But I'd since, you know, um, worked my way up and, you know, was in contention to win a medal. So I think, yeah, just having people aware of the sport outside of that once every four years would be um, beneficial for us. Any experiences? Uh, now you're running a, a, an agency in Promondo that, that has that cross-section of athletes, different sports, different genders. What, what kind of experience are you, you gathering there? Well, kind of going off what Sunday said, you know, we're, there's equality in judgment of performance, yet then if you draw back the curtains, there's not the same uh, infrastructure or resources for everybody across all sports, yet they're judged on the same you know, platform. So, you know, if you can be a full-time athlete, you've had these resources, you've had that, you never have to worry about finances or whatever it might be, then there's an expectation you're going to be able to give more to your sport, your improvement, and then your overall performance on a weekend. Whereas we have athletes that we represent who, you know, train in the morning, go to work, train again in the evenings, but then get judged on TV and through social media with a win or a loss on the weekend. And, and that for me is not fair. Um, but the reality is, you know, there's benefits to social media as well, regardless of gender. Uh, and so you're trying to utilize that. And in sports management, it is a, a balance of performance helping you as a person, but then also building for life after sport, because as a couple of us here know, you can't play it forever. And the last thing you want to do is transition into life post pro sport and not have, you know, pretended I uh, started up um, with a bit of experience and whatever it is you might transition into. Um, I want to wrap up with a, a hopefully a reasonably easy question as well, but it's something that I think uh, we can get a really good insight from from all of you. Are we proud of how sport affects mental health? 
are we proud of, of what it can do and what it's been doing? And is there anything we'd like to sort of maybe alter at all? No, I think for me, I think sport has a really positive effect on mental health. Just exercising, like being physical is so good for you. I think it's, you know, it's the, the outside in, it's those external factors, which are what can be negative towards the individual's mental health then as well. Um, I think a focus for sports teams, whether they are professional or, you know, that under 12 team playing over at Curtin University on Saturday is that they create strong, robust individuals. And then no matter what happens, no matter what happens on the outside coming in, that person is, is armed to be able to deal with it. And that makes them a better player on the field then as well, or a better, you know, on the track, whether they're competing individually or, or in a team as well. So, you know, I, I think sport, yeah, it is, it is good for your mental health. It's great for your mental health, being involved in a group, competing for something, having a goal to achieve is, is great. Whether you're achieving that goal or not, like failing that goal is good because it improves you as well. It's just, I think it's the external factors which can detract and then creating those people that are strong enough to, to deal with it. Yeah, fair. Love that. Yeah, I feel like you just really need to build those mental models and um, get into seeing the team psych. And I think as long as we're buying into that um, space, whatever that external stuff is that's coming in, we'll have the equipment to be able to just handle it. So, yeah, I think it's just the um, buying in from yeah either young age or now. It's just, yeah, getting into that space as soon as possible. And I think hearing, sorry, I think hearing people like yourself say stuff like that would be really powerful for particularly young people that, that want to change the way that they, they feel. How about yourself? Yeah, I think my individual career has had, you know, a profound effect on my life, sort of building that resilience, that confidence, independence. Um, so yeah, it's been majority very positive. And I think now even moving into a, a, a team spot, a big focus for us in the rugby team is not our results, but how we conduct ourselves on and off the court and what kind of legacy we want to leave behind and what kind of values we have as a team. And I think that's had a, a great effect on, on mental health because we're not judging ourselves based on how many goals we scored or what Bob down the road thinks of us, but like who we are as a team and how we carry ourselves. So that's brilliant. Yeah. Love it. Ah, uh, sport's the best. Uh, you know, it evokes only sport and music, in my opinion, can create that raw emotion that's natural, can be uncontrollable at times. The Olympics are going on right now, and you know, all of a sudden, I'm a grown man. And I'm like sitting next to my wife. She's crying. She's looking over. Is that a tear duck? And I was like, No, no, no. I'm okay. But seeing Jess Fox get the gold, or wherever I might be, like it's it's amazing. So make the most of it because it can create things and give you purpose. It can make you feel. Sometimes we go through days numb, just going through the nine to five, and the, you punch out, sit on a couch and get engaged in it but just because you're following them you're supporting them you want the best out of them doesn't mean you should drag them down try and tear them apart if they fail in your eyes uh, because trust me no one puts their bodies through what athletes do living in pain missing parties going to bed early diets nutrition you know all those things unless they truly want to win for their team on a weekend or get the best out of their individual events so enjoy it but also know that it shouldn't be something you also make your right to reach out to someone. But I love it. You know, on a weekend, you'll find me at a seven-year-old's basketball game and I live and breathe that win or loss with Maggie. And then I go down and watch Bonnie's football where she's working on her AFL. I don't know how she manages to kick backwards more than she does forwards, but, you know, just seeing her celebrate is incredible. Progress is progress. So, yeah, enjoy it for what it is. You don't have to just, write, you know, rely on the professional athletes, go and enjoy the junior base or go out and exercise and enjoy the benefits it brings to you personally. Well, music and, uh, and sport were the two first editions uh, of the round table. So you've, you've wrapped it up very nicely. Uh, thanks so much for joining us and, and really appreciate all your insights. Thanks, Robbie.